How are folks doing today? Good? Good. I have heard great things about how engaged you all are as a community, so I'm excited to be able to share space um, and to hopefully also engage you in a little bit of my narrative as well as engage with yours. Um, thank you, Doris, for sharing the quick bio. Um, before I get started, I do want to take a moment um, today to honor um, the land that we are on, um, the Duwamish land and all the other communities in the surrounding area, like the Salish and the Muckleshoot. Um, I think it's really important on today and every day to make sure that we recognize that we um, are not all natives to this land um, and we should pay tribute to those who are still with us and those who we have lost. Um, so I am going to move us through, hopefully, an engaging experience. Um, I had the longer bio, right, which says a lot about my career and my educational degrees, but I'm also a community member. I think first and foremost, I'm a student always, and I always feel like I'm learning um, so much from all the different roles that I'm in. Um, and because of that, um, I hope to learn from you all today. So we're gonna actually begin with a little bit of a call and response. So what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna show you a couple of BuzzFeed charts, and I'm gonna see if you can relate to what they are demonstrating to us. And if you can relate to what the image is showing us, um, I just want to hear a, a yes or a snapping or a nodding of the head to let me see who in the room um, feels like this can be a relatable experience for them. So, let's see. There we go. When you are searching for a job or a new opportunity, you pretty much feel like people are qualified for a job and then there's you. Can I get a yes or a nodding of the head or a snapping? Yes? Yeah, okay. okay. What about this one? Your thoughts when someone says that you would be good for a job role or team? Any, any folks feel this way sometimes? No? I see some folks being unsure if they should say yes, but their heads are like slowly moving forward. Um, what about this one here? Reasons why a good thing happened to you. Uh, luck, a mistake, because something bad is about to happen. Any relatable experiences out there? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to pause here real quick. Uh, as a first-generation college graduate, Chicana, um, somebody who comes from a low-income background, working class, um, this often came up for me in my educational journey. Right? I got scholarships, and I thought I was winning them because like, they were like a prize, right, uh, instead of being like awarded them. Um, and I would often talk about scholarships in that way until one of my mentors was like, you didn't really win the scholarship, you were awarded the scholarship. It's just kind of this thing that they don't really tell you when you're going into education that's called hidden curriculum. For those of us who are first-generation college students, uh, we may experience this more often. But I created this chart in collaboration with stu two students of color um, who I work with who are also first-generation college students. And we thought about what is a shared experience for us, which is that oftentimes when we are awarded a scholarship or an award, this is what we feel like. So a very small part of us feels like we deserved it. There's a larger piece that feels like it's because we're a first-generation college student, and so that scholarship or award was made just for us, and so that's the only reason we got it. Uh, the other part of us feels like it's because we're a person of color, and then there's another big part of us is that because we're poor, or we're working class, or we come from low SES, right? Um, as somebody who works with programs now that actually offer scholarships and works with students, the amount of times that I have heard this is amazing, right? Tabling at the U of A for First Cats, which is our first-gen services, a student actually came up and said, I'm so excited that you work with first-generation college students. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be an awesome conversation. Next thing she said was, I wish I was first-gen so I could rack up all the free scholarships. Right? And it made me think, wow, Oftentimes we think of merit, like deserving and working hard and demonstrating a skill set, has to be completely separate from all of these other things. They can't possibly exist together, right? 
So when I was talking with students, this is kind of what we came up with as a reality for us often, which is the pieces around who we are and the upbringing that we have, being first gen and not necessarily having given or chosen family, specifically given family who are related to us who went to college, um, being people of color, and then being low SES, that we basically feel like we only get scholarships because we come from a diverse background, right? These things can't exist together, the idea of deserving it at the same time. Can anybody relate to, to this experience and maybe applying it to other contexts, even if it wasn't just a scholarship? Can any, does anybody want to shake their head or say yes, questions, maybe, right? So this is an interesting dynamic um, because it may not be true for all of us. And sometimes it's not true until we sit with it for a while and we try to make sense of what it means. Um, but ultimately, in looking at some of those charts and diagrams, what the students and I um, really discovered is that oftentimes there's this narrative about particular communities that is so pervasive and embedded that we sometimes start believing that we didn't really deserve to be in spaces and that we get these messages, whether explicitly or implicitly, that maybe we really didn't deserve to be somewhere, right? But for us, and in a lot of the work that I do, this is how I see it, right? And if anything, these should all be kind of mixed in together, which is that there is, shouldn't be this distinction between being somebody who comes from a diverse background, being first gen, being a person of color, being low SES, and deserving something. That those things can exist together. And that despite the fact that oftentimes people may give messages that, well, you did deserve it, but within the context of being first gen and applying for that first gen scholarship. It's like, no, I am first gen. I have something to offer these institutions, and I deserved that scholarship, right? That all of these things can be happening for us simultaneously. So what is this idea of feeling like you may not belong um, or that you're not supposed to be somewhere? Have you all heard of this? Right? The idea of being an imposter. So a fake, a not supposed to be here, a they, the university, let me in by mistake. Right? Somehow I got here, but the teacher's going to find out that I'm not really that smart and I probably shouldn't be in this class. Or that maybe I get aid, and once they find out that I don't do the best at these things, they're going to take it away because I really don't deserve to be in this space, right? Um, and in many ways, um, there's a lot of research that's looking at specifically imposter syndrome amongst these particular communities at their intersection. So what does it mean to be, for me, a woman of color, be first-generation college student, um, and now graduate, and kind of make meaning of this? So. When I thought about imposter syndrome, I never actually learned of it as a concept. I think I learned of it as a feeling. Right? As an undergraduate student, um, I am the daughter of working class parents. Um, it was really hard for me to go to a place like UC Berkeley and feel like I belonged. Um, it didn't feel like I had a place there often. Um, and that feeling of longing to belong somewhere and feeling really misunderstood was really what a lot of folks will call imposter syndrome. And so this didn't come to me just because I like study things like this, but it actually came to me because I was feeling things like this. Um, and one of the things that I really wanted to make to emphasize in our conversation together is the fact that imposter syndrome and other ways of feeling like we don't belong is not a coincidence, right? You all are at Highline, and um, as Dr. Luna had mentioned, it's a super diverse campus, right? And the history of higher education institutions was not created for people like us. Right? Universities and colleges were not created necessarily with first-generation college students in mind. And maybe we have a couple of those places who are doing the work to really transition the culture of how we teach and learn. And a lot of that can be said about Highline here. But historically, colleges and universities haven't always thought about the belonging of folks of color, of folks from low-income backgrounds, of first-generation college students, right? Um, and so what I want for us to think about, and I'm going to pose for us really quick, is that we are a group of people 
who are changing the face and the purpose of institutions by being here, right? We are thriving here in many ways. We're demanding that we too have a place to learn skills and knowledge that helps us improve our communities and ourselves, right? We're really changing and transforming the possibility of what education can be and what it means. And ultimately, to me, that means that we are scholars, even if that's not something that we call ourselves all the time. So I, to help kind of understand a little bit about my idea of belonging and maybe not feeling that way throughout college, I want to share with you a little bit about kind of some motivational factors that helped me get in to college and stay motivated in college. Um, the reason I'm sharing these factors is because these are the same things that made me feel like an outsider or a fake, particularly because college um, did not value these sets of values within its community. So for me, home has been essential. Any other folks in the room, the idea of home, who you turn to there, who you engage with, who else does that motivate to be here? Can I see some nodding, raising hands? All right. Yes. And what about family? This can be given or chosen. Yeah? So work ethic, right? My father is an amazing worker. Uh, he, does, he is illiterate, doesn't know how to read. Um, he does not have a high school diploma. And he is one of the hardest working people I've ever met in my life, right? He taught me so much about not giving up um, that I take that with me every single day into the classroom, when I get to grade and engage with students to understand who they are and what they're learning, right? What about work ethic? Is that something that motivates some folks here? They've seen it demonstrated, yeah? Okay. So community-centered education. So for me as a first-generation college student, and for many of us, even if we don't identify as a first-gen student, we don't necessarily go to college for just ourselves. We go to college so that there's other opportunities. We go to college so that we have different possibilities. Sometimes we go to college because of uh, a necessity to remove ourselves from maybe toxic places or spaces, but to develop other kinds of communities around us, right? And then there's like culture. For me, culture was a huge influential factor. I had the opportunity to take Chicanx studies in high school, um, and that completely propelled my identity development forward, meaning I actually cared about who I was, where I came from, right? How many for you would you say that culture and community are something that matter to you and being at Highline and moving forward? Yeah? Great. And for me, the other part of this is social justice, right? To me, education is about liberation. It's about freedom. It's about the opportunity to know how to create new forms of justice, how to create new forms of knowledge, how to build together, how to learn from each other. Right? how to break lots of rules, how to create other systems that actually care about people. Um, what are some other values for you all that keep you motivated? So I want you to turn to the person next to you and maybe share one or two things, or you can relate to one of these and just take a minute or two to talk about what has motivated you to be in this space and to learn here. Go ahead and take about another minute to wrap up and we'll see if folks want to share.
All right. Any brave souls out there want to share out? Thank you. So I just like to place myself in this environment because I feel like it's filled with intellectual minds and there's information that you can like obtain from any person in this room or out there or up there, anywhere really. So that's why I like to place myself in this environment. Yeah, we can snap to that. Yeah. Thank you. I come here because of my family, um, my mom, the single mom. And she'd be taking care of me most of my life. And I also come here to represent my culture and being Samoan and Polynesian. Ooh, yes. Uh, well, I decided to go back to school because um, I am Mexican and most of the Mexican community don't really, the majority don't have a background education, so I want to get the education so I could transmit the knowledge because knowledge is power and that's what my people need. Okay, okay. My teachers growing up played a really big role in motivating me to go to college because they just had really high expectations for me in general. My name is Willow, and my uh, my dad is white, but my mother is Ger is uh, Indian, and um, she's Native Alaskan, and um, I'm the only one educated or getting an education, and I wanted to graduate before her death. She's 71. We'll take like one more. All right, so um, I come back here uh, because I honestly feel like it's the first time in my life when I stepped in Highline that I've ever had the the, uh, the chance to have my dreams intersect with opportunity and become reality. Wow. Yeah. I feel like that's like level Audre Lorde quote right there. Drop the mic. Yes. And you're leaving when you say, right? <laughs> no, it's okay. It's just like, it was like a pivotal exit. You just... Drop something and then like left. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank all of you for sharing. Um, I actually am gonna kind of build off of that that was just shared. So my idea of going to college was was my dream. Right? My dream became a dream when I saw my niece be born um, to my 18 year old brother and his 17 year old girlfriend. Right, um, six months after high school graduation, their high school graduation, um, and uh, she seeing her and wanting to have at least the option of other possibilities for her as a Chicana woman growing up in the Central Valley in California, which is a place where I had pretty much two options, which was to get pregnant or expectations, was to get pregnant before or after I graduated from high school, like quickly after, or to get married. That was really like the limited idea of what I was told I was possible of becoming, right, uh, in high school. And with her birth, um, inspired me to think about a different kind of dream. And then I heard people say words like college. And I was like, what is this thing that people go to that's called college? And in many ways, that internally put me on this path of becoming college bound because I cared to in look into it. And I also started surrounding myself by folks who would tell me what it was about. With that being said, as I continue to go into college, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is um, I got there and then I was like, uh-oh. So I'm in my dream right now, right? Because nobody in my extended family, I have 19 cousins, um, had gone to a university. What am I supposed to do next? Because I am in my dream, which is to get a college education. And now I'm about to graduate, and I'm really tired. Do I have to have like another dream? Is this enough? What is going on here, right? Um, and for me, in that space of being really tired, one of the things I didn't realize at the time of being an undergraduate student and moving through those spaces is that I was navigating and negotiating so many cultural worlds so many different spaces that it was taxing and it was super exhausting. Um, 
a key kind of feminist scholar that I often turn to to make sense of my work. Um, and I wouldn't be able to share and engage in any way if I hadn't engaged specifically with her as Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, it's like the only academic reference that I have for our presentation, um, and it should be her. So I'm going to leave this here for a second, and then I will narrate it for us. But I want to bring up this concept of borders, particularly around boundaries, when we think about school and we think about identity. So borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderline is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It is in a constant state of transition. The prohibited and forbidden are its inhabitants. What does this have to do with college? What does it have to do uh, with being a first generation Chicana in college and navigating spaces? Right. Well, for me, I, while I was in my undergraduate, didn't really understand the extent to which I was co crossing cultural borders, metaphoric borders, meaning not necessarily like geographic borders like I experience daily in Tucson, Arizona, which is only 100 miles away from Mexico and the border um, there, um, but borders as in the idea of moving between home and then moving to college, going to my family, and then coming into college and having conversations, right? There was this constant tension between me to make sense of what it meant to be what my family calls me, Vicky, um, back home, and then to be Vicky in college, right? It was a very different person oftentimes, and I didn't know how to make sense of those things because neither of them seemed to be welcome in either space. And I'm gonna say that again because I think sometimes we focus on the college experience without also talking about the home experience, which is that I didn't know how to be myself in either space. Sometimes I would go home and talk about college with my family, and unfortunately, sometimes the conversations would lead to things like, oh, you think because you're in college that you know everything now, right? Or you think that you know this word, so then you think you're smarter than us, right? And at that time, I didn't know how to make sense of those things. But then I was also going to college, and I would look around. Anybody been to San Francisco or Bay Area? Yeah? It's kind of similar to what Seattle is <laughs> transitioning into. But when I went to Berkeley, everybody looked like they knew what they were doing. And like their backpacks cost <laughs> like half the price of my mom's rent, right? Like just for their backpack, right? Their laptop was a couple months rent <laughs> for my family. And I was constantly getting messages in that space too that I didn't belong. The way that I talked, the way that I walked, the reference points that I had, right? When people talked about like, I want you to close your eyes and envision a leader. Envision somebody who's innovated. And like the person that was back there, I thought of my single mother. I was like, my mom. She raised us. She raised us by herself. She had to be innovative. She had to be created. She figured out how to keep a roof over our head. She also figured out how to keep me safe and help me prioritize my education. Like, that's who I think of, right? Well, other people are like, Bill Gates and all these other folks. And I was like, I actually didn't even know who Bill Gates was, except for the fact that I got a scholarship from him. And that's the only reason I knew who he was, right? Um, and so I often felt conflicted about these things, and I, wanna talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about that because sometimes when we're thinking about belonging and where we feel comfortable, I want to just acknowledge that sometimes the same spaces that, and people or things that motivate us, like these things, can also be the things that we internalize and feel stress from or feel like we don't necessarily connect to or are struggling to figure out how do I make my culture matter in this new space, right? How do I take my college education effectively into my home communities and into my culture as a tool, right? For me, that has been a lot of translation. I think of it as like a translation. It's a lot of work, right? The things that I read in my textbooks, the things that I um, heard in lecture, I could never say back home. Not because Folks couldn't understand it because they did understand it. They actually were living. We talked about social systems, structures, oppression, inequality. In the classroom, I was like, do you need an example? Because I can tell you tons of examples about how this plays out literally on Delville Avenue in Fresno, California, which is my grandmother's street, right? 
I could tell you tons of examples, but if I took that language back home, it often felt and made me feel very disconnected um, from community. And so I just um, want to take some time to acknowledge that that may be a reality for some of us, and it may be the ways in which we continue to cross these borders and boundaries, that we're figuring out who we are constantly in multiple spaces. And that is okay. It not, doesn't always feel okay. Um, but it's a part of many of our struggles to figure out who we are, right? Um, and I will say that um, in this space of tension, what, in what I often refer to as the borderlands um, and use a lot of Anzadua's work, is it cultivated a sense of identity in me that I was, in fact, a Chicana educator and a student, right? That my political identity, my gender, my race, ethnicity, that they were all tied up into who I was as an educator and as a student. And that I'm not gonna be somebody who's willing to separate those things, right? That I'm trying to be my authentic self in all the spaces that I move through. Um, and I want students who are also maybe thinking and struggling with some of these things to also feel like we belong. And sometimes that means we carve out other spaces to belong to or we create other opportunities of belonging for ourselves and each other without forgetting right, who we come from, where we are from, and the people that we care about most. So I'm gonna pose these big questions to us because they have a lot to do with what I'm talking about. I'm just gonna let them sit here. So where does knowledge come from and who gets to create knowledge? I'm posing these big questions because I think these questions are tied to the conversation around belonging especially when we think about college. So some folks talked about the idea of college providing opportunities to intersect with dreams and possibilities, right? We learn here, we engage in knowledge formation. An easier maybe question to ask is uh, what is a scholar? Or maybe a more difficult question to ask is what is a scholar? What I want you to do on your index card is to actually write down the numbers one and two. And what I want you to do we can give you another one, <laughs> is I want you to think about two people that you would consider a scholar. So having not really defined that, who are scholars to you? So at least, at least two options. Who are scholars that you know? You can be personally, yeah, just jot them down or hold them in your mind, take note. All right, let's take some responses here. So who are some of the people that we have? I put um, Anna Olivasa for all Did everybody catch that? I'll say it one more time. She said that um, I am and she is and we all are scholars. Any other volunteers? Thank you. Professors and your brother? Okay, thank you. She said her mother was a scholar, yes. yes. Do you mind saying that one more time into the mic? It's a beautiful story. My little sister, I consider her as a scholar um, because in her homeworks, her teacher puts like, um, refers to her students as a scholar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she's in kindergarten. Thank you all. So <clears throat> this question here, I tried to figure out a pretty succinct way of, of creating a definition of what a scholar means to me that's informed heavily, quite honestly, by women of color. <laughs> women of color feminists um, and a lot of other knowledge creators um, that I know as well. But these are the kinds of things that I think of when I think of a scholar, right? So I want us to, to just quickly, we're gonna, I'm gonna read these, and I want us to think about 
how the people that we've mentioned are definitely embodying a lot of what we have here, which is scholars are knowledge creators, right? They create ideas, theories, research, narratives, stories, and so much more. They take risks to learn more in order to become even better scholars. And scholars who take what they create seriously and they try to put it into practice are the special kind of scholar, right? Because they show us that what we study and learn can and should inform our actions. Meaning that it shouldn't just be in a textbook, right? It shouldn't just be something that we carry here, but we should actually be doing something with it. And that's not necessarily everybody's definition of scholar. Maybe your kindergarten sister is figuring out how she practices that every day, right? She probably gets a little bit more fun uh, homework than some of us get. Um, so she has a little bit more creative freedom to figure out who she is, but she is acting upon that. She's building and she's learning and she's growing, right? The types of theories of the flesh, meaning the lived experiences that my mother carries and teaches me every day, they're not written in any book. More so now, right, because folks like myself are writing books, right? We are choosing to tell their stories in many ways. But she has always been a scholar, right? Many of us are here today. So as I said earlier, I would argue that all of us are scholars. In fact, I said this earlier, and I'll say it one more time, right? We are changing the face and the purpose of education institutions by being here, by thriving here and demanding that we, too, have a place to learn skills and knowledge that help us improve our communities and ourselves. All of us are scholars, right? We are contributing to knowledge creation constantly. And I don't really want for you all to doubt that as a possibility, even in those moments of tension when we're figuring out where we belong and where we matter. So I know Thomas Bowie really well. Um, and so Thomas was like, this would not be a workshop by Victoria if there wasn't some kind of other activity. And he is definitely correct. So we're going to actually do an activity um, now together. And I'm going to find um, some folks to help me pass these out. So there is a worksheet. Um, it is a fairly familiar um, worksheet. It's called Where I Am From. Has anybody done an activity or a poem or something that's listed that way? No? Yeah? OK. So I'm going to have one. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so it's actually been edited and updated um, to include uh, some reference to critical race theory, particularly community cultural wealth, which is uh, Terry Yoso's concept. Um, so it's shifted. If you've done it before, what I'm going to ask, so just hold on a quick sec, is that this is going to be a silent activity. We're going to take about eight to 10 minutes to individually fill this out. What I encourage you to do is to not overthink it. Right? I am not a poet at all. My idea of performance is teaching. Like that's, my, that's what I do. I do not have a rhythm to how I speak, like this is, this is not my forte. And because of that, I encourage you to just immediately respond to the prompts, to not hold yourself back. And if you feel like you're slowing down at some place, then skip to the next one, okay? And just keep filling it out. This is for you to do on your own. Um, I will see if folks are willing to share. Um, and I also have examples of students who are willing to share um, here today. So knowing what we have talked about, right? Knowing about the ideas of imposter syndrome, but knowing about also the ideas that we too are scholars, we have lots to say and lots to offer. I want you to take this opportunity to reflect and think about the skills and assets that you bring with you to these spaces. So I'll play a little bit of music to kind of keep us on track, and then we'll check in in a couple minutes. Okay, so before I ask for folks to share out, I'm gonna sell a little bit of community agreements here. Um, one, um, we are um, going to make sure that folks do share that this is an affirming space. <laughs> we let them have their narrative and be able to share that in the ways that they wish. Um, so if everybody can agree to kind of snap or applaud when they're done to offer that, yeah? Is that cool with folks? Yes? Okay. Um, the other part of this is that the way that we will read this is that I really want you to 
not stop yourself and say, oh, wait, I didn't mean that, or, oh, I meant to say it in this way, right? Kind of edit out our voice. I really just want you to kind of read through what you have. And you have to promise to make sure, no matter if you left some things blank, that you still finish with the last line. Right? The last line is, I am a knowledge creator and scholar. So even if there's some other pieces that you didn't get to, you're going to end with saying that. Okay. So before I take volunteers, I want each of you to read to yourself what you wrote. Take a moment to just listen, to read, to not judge. Doesn't need to rhyme, doesn't need to make sense or sound like a complete thought. Just needs to be. So take a minute to do that. So to help us, I'm actually going to start with an audio from a student, um, and then we will take one to two volunteers from the room. So. This is a current, um, a really great student who just finished last May, right? She's a college graduate, first in her family also to go, um, and uh, she was more than happy to kind of share My it name is Ana Gabriel Hernandez Amudio, and I am a knowledge creator and scholar. I am from Veladoras for La Virgencita and sewing kits and cookie containers from the house on Calle 15 de Enero, yellow, tall, familiar. I am from Pasteles Aztecas in a competition of who makes the best tamales amongst my tias. P.S. It's my mother, but don't tell the rest of my tias. I am from two cities 60 miles apart, a home and a dream and a wall and a longing for the canales that flow through my abuelita's backyard from mariachis and cuidado con la llorona. I am from Hediondia, a plant my grandmother used to scare away los novios from mayonesa and boom boom by cumbia kings. I am from echale ganas to fight, but to not forget to love yourself. I am from teaching others from accepting what I call my chingones, an ongoing internal battle to eradicate the feeling that I am not worthy when in actuality I make the ground tremble. I am from families belong together because as a 14 year old, I should not have become an expert on visiting loved ones inside detention centers from the understanding that self love has a ripple effect that starts with us and heals generations. I am a knowledge creator and scholar. Anna is the one student that I have the privilege of working with. Um, had the privilege. I still talk about it as present, but I, we still connect. But are there any other folks who would be willing to share uh, their narrative? Give this person a round of applause, some snaps, some yes, yay. Okay, so mine wasn't that long, but um, so my name is Jason Guerrero, and what I call home is uh, Leon Guanajuato, Mexico. But I also call home Feather Away because I was raised in Feather Away. What I remember from Mexico is that um, it was a very small city, it was a community where people interacted a lot more than here. Here, people are just on their phones and stuff like that. A food that I that represents my family is seafood because my dad used to own a um, seafood restaurant in Mexico, and it was actually pretty. It was a business that went pretty good, so that just reminds me of home. Something I feel connected to is my phone, because that's where all my knowledge and my friendships will lie, and I feel like I could call my family from Mexico or any of my friends to just like you know socialize. Um, a song that really motivates me, it's called Me Against the World by Tupac. It just feels like it's always been that way, that I only got myself really to go against the world, being like a first-gen student also. So it just kind of motivates me to like keep on going. One thing I learned was from my father, his work ethic. Um, he's a really hardworking person. He, there was a point in my life where he worked day and night. So he had three jobs, so like he just showed, and I worked with them, so he just showed his ambition and his hunger to put food on our table, so, yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges I overcame was learning English. Uh, I felt like a sense of more belonging here once I learned English, because 
when I didn't know English, I felt like, I don't know, I was very small and, and I was like, I thought English was the only, I mean, Spanish was the only language in the whole world and I didn't realize that it wasn't, so I felt like I didn't belong here. Um, something that I still stand for or my, is myself, the people I love and my Latino community because I feel like a lot of people don't have the skill or confidence to really speak up in matters that actually matter and I like to just go against the grain and really speak on what I believe from my heart. Um, one experience I learned that really helped me was it actually shaped my mentality in life because my neighbor's house got burned down and I learned that m mentality is everything. Like you, you can either, like if your house burns down, you have the option to think like, you can just panic and not do anything or you can think about what you're gonna do tomorrow to like, you know, get out of the situation. I am a knowledge creator and scholar. Thank you. Any other? All right, this will be, go ahead. We'll do um, two more. Okay, my name is Willow Ray Forrest. Oh, yeah. oh. My, my name is Willow Ray Forrest. I'm from, oh, I am a knowledge creator and scholar. I am from a car in the parking lot. I am from Nest Pars, Apache, Alaska, and in White Mountain. I'm from, I'm from Deer, Bear, and, okay. The food that represents. Oh, you can just reread your cards in there. Okay. I am from Deer, Bear, and Rabbit. <laughs> I am from the valleys of Alaska, Wimwit Mountains, and Mountain Flower. My family's cooking of deer, and my grandma making muckluck shoes. They're made out of seals. They're seal slippers, muckluck. From Native American and peacemaker, I am from rushing river waters, flowing and ever changing. From the heart and song of my mother, I am from surfing Paku Nanakuli, adrenaline and stinging saltwater spray from the oceans of Oahu, where I like to swim. I am from art, portraits, from dyslexia. I am the girl who needed the mirrors who broke them all. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I have overcome. I am from the voice of reason. I stand up for people and animals. I have a heart of peace and humanity, and I'm a believer of freedom and an advocate for children. Because I cannot stand hate and purposeful evil acts, I'm from the bridge I studied and refused to give up. I am knowledge creator and scholar. Thank you. My name is Modu. I am a knowledge creator and a scholar. I am from the Atlantic Ocean, the blue waves of the beach, the smiling coast of West Africa. I am from Fass, not Bank, the Gambia. I am from the Tilapia Face, the Jalaf Rise, the land of Kunta Kinte, the warriors, and the freedom fighters. I am from the school, the hood, and the youth center. From Wolof, the land of Burba Jalaf. I am from the giant mahogany tree. The songs and lyrics of Bob Marley, One Love. I am from the tolerance of my adolescent, negotiate, compromise, and stand up. I am working with trauma-informed youth on a client-centered approach. From first, I am the first to complete high school. Uh, the feeling was happy, grateful, accomplished, and joy. I am from social justice and human rights, because it's both a moral and public health issue to me. From the lessons of growing up in a madrasa school, to the role that women has played in that process, I am a knowledge creator and a scholar. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I know that there's a, right? Many of you are headed to your class and things, um, and I really appreciate you sharing your narratives. And I actually just want to end my time up here 
um, taking an opportunity to not only affirm some of the narratives that we share today, but also express some um, information to our educators in the room. So I'm gonna leave um, this on the screen again and hope that you all take a moment to believe this, even if it is just for a second. Um, and to let me give you some words of advice or wisdom, as my mentor would say, uh, which is first to our students, right? Be a scholar who uses your work to better your communities. Make a commitment to doing that. That's not always gonna be an easy commitment, but I encourage you to think about how what you're learning, what you're doing is serving others, but also serving you, your passion, your love, and your interest, and your way of change, and your way of being. So be an active student, right? As a first generation college student, I created my own resources, I created my own resume builders, I created my own, all these things. One, because I didn't know that those things existed on my campus, and then when I found them, I was like, thank you, because I've been so tired trying to figure out how to do all these other things that everybody else seems to have figured out, right? So be active, ask questions, don't worry if your question sounds like you don't know it's okay lots of people don't know and you asking that one question may help others also feel like they're getting an answer to something that matters to them but it's really important for you to stay actively engaged in your education and to the experience that you want to build community right at the u of a part of what my charge is is to actually have our first generation college students not just think about their experiences as being the first to go to college, but also to think about all the other intersectional identities that they have and how that plays out when they move through the classroom and when they move through campus. And so it's really important for you to build a sense of community and a literal community with others as you navigate these spaces. So for some of you, you're here for class, right? Um, and so you, maybe you're taking a step to think about how your cultural identity is closely tied to who you are as a student. And I would say hold your cultural identity close to you as you continue to defy odds. The fact that there is the survey to better understand what you all need and want to engage in, particularly around ethnic studies, is super amazing, right? Um, and it's really important for you to think of your identity and culture as a tool to really overcome and resist some narratives that they already are out there about who we are and what we're capable of. Last is to trust that your resiliency should not be taken for granted. I'm gonna say that one again. So, trust that your resiliency should not be taken for granted. I don't know how many times I moved through situations and instead of somebody helping pave the way, they just told me, well, there's gonna be a bump and then there's gonna be a roadblock and then there's gonna be this, but you're gonna be fine. And I was like, but I am tired already. Why can't it just be different, right? And I would say to you that do not let folks take resiliency as this test to keep checking if you can keep being it, if you could keep doing it, if you could keep practicing it. The reality is, is when you come from communities, and I can only speak to mine, low income, working class, folks of color, high concentrations of poverty, the idea of resilience is literally surviving. Right? College campuses, should not be testing this of us at a constant, right? And it should not be taken for granted that we do in fact have that skill. And then these are the things I wanna say to our educators. So if I'm gonna pose this to our students, then I'm gonna pose these to our educators. So if you see students use the tools of advocacy, self-authorship, leadership, et cetera, support them. Don't stifle their energy, right? Like, don't stop the same tools that we want them to use. You should be proud and probably feel challenged because it hurts sometimes when they direct that self-authorship at you because you have not done your best at serving them, okay? You need to listen to our students. We also need a clear pass, right? Do not simply explain why bumps in the road exist. That is not our role as educators. We're here to create other paths, to create other journeys, to create clear ways for our students to maneuver these institutions. And then honor their resilience, right? Don't throw another trick in front of them and say perform, figure it out. Give the information, support them, guide them. We are not here to test that our students are actually in fact resilient. We live that every day and we should trust that every day. 
The last thing I want to say is that I really want and hope for you all to take this as an opportunity to never really doubt your ability to be a scholar, to be an advocate for knowledge formation um, that has been forgotten, that has been yet to be created. Never doubt that you are worth taking a risk for. Never doubt that we as educators and scholar comrades should support you in your journey, because that is who we are and what we commit to. Never doubt that your questions, your story, your cultures deserve a place here in college. You are the scholars many of us have been waiting for, and we need you to embrace your own power, to stand in that power, to know that the abilities, cultures, histories, and families that you bring to the table are exactly what we have been waiting for to transform these places. Thank you for spending some time with me today. And this is the hashtag that I often use, which is Mihasu College. Um, fact of first generation college graduates, Latina Chicanas are some of the highest rates of that sub community. Um, and so um, feel free to use this to tie to the talk today. Um, and I'm totally happy and excited to answer questions. Thank you for your time. <laughs>